Hello, my name is Ron John Narg. I'll begin by sharing my screen and I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and aging. Uh, I'm president of the R42 Institute. What is the R42 Institute? We invest in companies, uh, we invent products, and we also inform people about difficult technologies. And certainly longevity technologies are difficult. Uh, we're seeing this intersection of biology and engineering uh, that is actually creating disruptive forces. We'll talk about those things. Uh, we also give courses and uh, fellows that come and work with us and invent new ideas and really work at the intersection of artificial intelligence and biology. Who am I? Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been in the mobile industry. I've been uh, at the earliest stages of artificial intelligence since the uh, mid-1980s. I'm involved with many biotech companies, uh, either through my investments or through my uh, leadership activities as chairman of some of these companies. Uh, Helex is one for drug discovery. Uh, GT Cardio is one for measuring blood pressure in wearables. Uh, we'll talk a few, about a few of these things. Uh, I've been really in the business for about 30 years now. Uh, but where did I get my inspiration from developing clever devices? And it was really from Star Trek and you can see many of the devices here that were portrayed in the earliest versions of Star Trek. Uh, I'm, of course, thinking about the very earliest versions with William Shatner as Captain Kirk. Interestingly enough, many of these things are now in place, like the mobile phone, uh, the iPad, tablet computers. Uh, we do actually have the tricorder. There's been some work there where we're measuring things in uh, wearables. Uh, the thing we don't have is the robot doctor uh, or the android. We're still waiting for that. And uh, what we're going to cover today is really what is artificial intelligence? What are the techniques? How, how does it work? In this short talk, try to give you an intuition, at least, of the techniques that are being used. And then specifically look at AI in longevity. And what are the things uh, and the techniques that can actually uh, help us in uh, making a stronger uh, case? So, first of all, what is intelligence? You know, we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, this question was asked to about 100 uh, academics about 30 years ago. And people asked, what is intelligence? And the answers that came back was uh, a kind of a, uh, uh, figuring out or making sense of things, uh, the ability to be able to reason and plan, uh, think abstractly, uh, comple understand complex ideas. It wasn't test taking, it wasn't book learning. It's rather like uh, a deeper capability. And we think about intelligence of being self aware, understanding language. Uh, understanding emotional, emotional quotient, IQ as opposed to EQ, or EQ as opposed to IQ, uh, the ability to plan and be creative and solve problems. Uh, so what is artificial intelligence? Usually artificial intelligence is not that. Uh, we see artificial intelligence in our daily lives. We see it in our phones. When we talk to our smart speakers, uh, usually AI in our daily life solves a vertical problem. Uh, one problem to solve a, one problem is solved one at a time, like fingerprint recognition or uh, iRobot vacuum cleaners uh, or uh, your car to avoid accidents. The cruise control is now more advanced where it will automatically stop uh, or automatically slow down in, in the, for the car in front of you and then speed up when there's more space. Uh, and as a result, we have different definitions uh, for artificial intelligence. And we start off with uh, GoFi, good old fashioned artificial intelligence. And that usually refers to the type of systems that are in the 60s and 70s where we would sit down an expert, it could be a doctor, and sit him down or her down and ask her the rules and the 
intuition of why she is diagnosing a particular illness for a particular patient. I would write down those rules and our job was how to encode those rules in an efficient form uh, into a machine. In the mid 1980s onwards, uh, we started seeing statistical techniques uh, start to appear, uh, which would actually learn from large amounts of data rather than sitting down and writing the rules. And so some of these techniques would be known as machine learning. These would be numerical recipes uh, that would actually determine uh, patterns from the data. And we'll talk a little bit about neural networks and deep learning, but there are a number of other techniques like support vector machines, random forests, HUMS, these are not HUMS, these are hidden Markov models. And uh, if you look at the original definition of artificial intelligence, it's again, not what we're seeing in the field. Uh, it is uh, the academic field to provide human-like performance. And uh, cynics would say, well, once you actually get a machine to do it, by definition, it's not human-like anymore, so it can't be classified as AI. And so we have this uh, terminology of strong AI or generalized artificial intelligence where one system uh, trained on one task could be applied to a different task and actually get to human performance. And in the literature, not just the uh, lay press in the newspapers, but also in the scientific press, all of these terms are often used interchangeably and often uh, people get into a heated arguments saying that, well, that's not AI, that's machine learning, or that's not machine learning, that's no really AI. Um, in general, because these are now used interchangeably, these terms used interchangeably, uh, it has now uh, been a meaningless argument. So we, it's used in a very wide uh, a, a array of applications uh, over and above its original definitions. So what is AI? What is, there's two types of learning. There's uh, supervised learning, where we take data that is labeled, and the data is labeled uh, one character at a time in this handwriting character example, and we, uh, provide a label and that is the training data and we create a model either in this particular case one for each character or for all of the characters in one go and when we get a new character we try and find the nearest model and so that's what's known as supervised learning and most of the systems we see out there are actually supervised learning systems uh, there are the other type of system is unsupervised learning and this is where we're looking at unlabeled data. Uh, we're looking at clustering. Uh, and we actually are able to look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the patterns uh, to actually uh, be able to cluster things in, in, in different uh, segments. And this example is with movies. For example, you might have know who the actors are and where they were born and where they're TV shows or movies are played. And then after the fact, you might give these clusters uh, labels. And uh, today, it is very much an interdisciplinary field. And the field originally was in the field of computer science, maybe engineering, sometimes mathematics. Uh, you know, I, my background was in electrical engineering and moving on to uh, uh, engineering and then uh, uh, my postdoc work was actually in the Department of Psychology at Stanford University, which is about 30 years ago, where we're trying to think about mathematical models of how the brain works. And what we would look at is uh, thinking about where these neural networks be inspired by how the brain works. These neural networks, these are mathematical models, and these work much better now because we now have a lot more data, we have a lot more computing power. And we also have more tweaks on how to train these systems. So what are these uh, neural networks? These are, the, are being extremely powerful. The poster child for this is winning the game of Go. And unlike chess, where you can compute every single combination, 14 moves ahead, and choose the best move, uh, Go has so many combinations, it's got more atoms than, the, in, the, than in, the universe, in the universe. And yet, despite this, humans do a pretty good job. And so when Google's AlphaGo system won uh, uh, the game against the grandmaster at Go, it was a major achievement. But what did he have to 
uh, be up against? What does the human know that was it up against? So we have FLOPS, uh, floating point operations per second, which is the calculation of how fast your processor is. And the amount of processing power was 10 to the 16 FLOPS that was used to uh, uh, beat the human. And what do we as humans run at? Well, we run at almost like 0 0.01 FLOPS, you know, hardly a fair competition. And what, but what's amazing is that our brain only uses 20 watts of power. And yet uh, the servers, the number of servers that were used in the AlphaGo computation was much, much higher than that. Maybe, maybe many, many kilowatts. So a thousand times as much. Now our smartphones run about 10 to the 12 flops. And our, you know, people that say, well, maybe we need 10 to the 18 flops uh, to replicate the human brain. Um, that would be the hardware only. We may still, still get the same wrong answer back quicker. So it's not just the uh, processing power, it's also what you do with it. So these neurons are the fundamental cell in the human brain. Uh, this is a, a diagrammatic cartoon of a neuron where uh, the cell has uh, impulses coming into it. And if the impulses are big enough, it will send impulses onto other neurons, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand other neurons. And in the brain, we have these neurons uh, connected to many, many other neurons, with about 100 billion neurons in the human brain. And we try and create a mathematical model of a actual neuron. So what does that actually mean? We have inputs coming into a, uh, a sum summation module, and these inputs are weighted. So what are these inputs? These could be pixel values of an X-ray image. Uh, these could be uh, sequences of uh, heartbeat uh, rates. Uh, and these are coming into a summation, but weighted first. And if the summation is big enough, it goes through a function to know if it's big enough, this gets sent off, sent off to these other neuron modules. These, this is the fundamental computational module. And this was actually quite an old concept. It came uh, in about uh, 1958 by Rosenblatt, who was a neuroscientist um, and had a computer the size of the room that would uh, implement this function. Uh, and you know, the field has a lot of hype uh, still today, but you know, even in the 1950s, they said uh, that you could have a, a uh, computer that would be able to walk, talk, see, write, and reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence within five years. And this has been the story of the field for decades, it's always five years, but we are now getting amazing achievements. And so unlike the human brain, we have a gross simplification of how we arrange these computational uh, nodes, and we arrange them in layers. And uh, the inputs are coming in. Again, these could be uh, pixels or pixel values or sound values um, uh, or actual uh, heart rate values or blood pressure items. And we uh, have them coming to nodes and they are weighted and then they come to a summation. And if it's strong enough, it gets sent on to every other node in every subsequent layer. And it turns out that the uh, the layers uh, are arranged that in, if you have a single middle hidden layer uh, that you can solve very difficult what we call non-linear uh, problems. And the outputs would be what you want your answer to be. You know, is it actually a lung cancer or is it, uh, is it uh, a safe image? Um, and so this is how what we do in today's neural networks. We're building these networks, these topologies. And in medicine, we uh, have done a number of uh, experiments. This is Deep Patient. And Deep Patient takes a lot of uh, uh, data points from patient records. Um, and it's trained on uh, uh, 700,000 patient records. And uh, we're taking these inputs like weight and uh, waist size and height and your blood metrics and uh, you know, things like your cholesterol and your blood pressure and uh, different medications you've taken, uh, little uh, scans that you've taken and try to determine what disease you have. 
And of course, it's very, very complex. It's very nonlinear. Um, and it does a pretty good prediction for many diseases. And uh, you know, so if we have more data, these things need a lot of data. It's been tried on about 70 odd diseases. And it can be used for many other problems like drug uh, discovery and trying to uh, develop efficient clinical trials. We'll talk about these things in a minute. And uh, how does that help us in aging? So aging is uh, extremely important. You know, can we live longer with these computational techniques? And by living longer, you know, we think about underlying mechanisms of aging, but also uh, how do we just actually get better for any particular disease? How can we get healthcare provided to us cheaper, made available to us uh, more efficiently? And can we get better treatments and better drugs at lower cost and quicker delivery? And so the issue is, you know, there are many, many data sources available to us. There's a million articles uh, published every year, medical articles. Uh, there have been studies that say, unfortunately, that many of these medical articles uh, cannot be replicated, not because people are lying, but the conditions are, can, are actually difficult to replicate. Uh, human uh, diagnosis is hard. Doctors are overworked. Many of the tests uh, are, 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 are not uh, particularly significant. The classic case is the PSA test for uh, prostate cancer, which has high rates of uh, uh, false positives. So even if it tells you that you have prostate cancer, you may not actually have it. Um, and so people you usually have this discussion with your doctor, well, should you take the test or not take the test? Uh, and uh, because if you have a ripple effect of other illnesses or other tests that are done, it might actually uh, harm you. So diagnosis this is hard. Humans have difficulty in diagnosing people. Uh, there are lots of biases that we have. Um, people come in, we make an immediate the, uh, an assessment. The excellent doctors have seen so many patients, they can make a very good uh, 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 diagnosis and prescription uh, just by looking at people. Uh, but they also have their biases, right, on what's happening in the field, uh, what's happening with your background. The good ones are trying to sort of normalize for that and take account for those kinds of things. But we all have behavioral biases as well in decision making. And so when you go to your doctor, people are, are scared of going to the doctor, not least because it's, uh, a, uh, uh, it's expensive, uh, it's uncomfortable, uh, people are worried. Uh, and we want to say, can we have a more quantitative example by using data? And data is expensive. Data is actually uh, very, very valuable because it can help you discover a new drug. It can help you discover a new treatment. Um, and if you look on the dark web, uh, this is from Experian, they say the uh, medical records are more expensive than any other kind of data. And we need to have data to make new things, to reduce costs, make life better. Quick biology lesson, quick diversion. We all have DNA, as we all know. And what's amazing about DNA is the same in every cell. Uh, you know, the old theory is that, uh, that uh, you would have these genes and these uh, DNA would uh, create RNA and the RNA would create proteins. And these genes are fixed and genes would do, do one thing. And people would search for a gene for a particular trait or a gene for a particular illness. Uh, the new theory, of course, is these genes are expressed. Just because you have one gene doesn't mean you'll get that disease, but rather your environment and your lifestyle can turn these things on. Uh, when we see 23andMe, these uh, cheap gene sequencing systems, they're just looking at the genes that change a lot um, uh, with particular traits and diseases. There's about a million of those. And you find that some diseases do actually have a set of genes that indicate a particular level of traits. And uh, we're all getting uh, sequenced. Uh, there's lots and lots of initiatives to collect more and more genomes. Uh, genomes uh, databases are going to be the lifeblood of figuring out new uh, treatments and new uh, drugs for uh, diseases. 
Uh, the cost is falling through the floor. Uh, perhaps a billion people might get uh, this genome sequenced. Eventually, by the end of the decade, pretty much everybody will be sequenced and there'll be a fundamental uh, tool to give you the right medicine at the right time. And uh, this would be, it would give us the era of personalized medicine, which would be very, very different to uh, today's era where medicine is given to everybody. Uh, rather here, it will be just given to the people where we know or have more chance to know that it actually will work. And the benefits, there are benefits and risks of personalized medicine. You know, we're going to be doing more tests uh, earlier. This will get, catch illnesses uh, earlier or reduce the costs of these illnesses. But uh, these tests will cost money as well. And we will get false positives and we will get false negatives. So this, the, there may be this overdiagnosis trend here. So there's two trends that will be have tension with each other. And so getting data is the lifeblood, as I said. And ideally, we'd have everybody's data in one place. Right now, the data is in lots of different places. And that's not ideal. Uh, and so ideally, we'd want to be able to break through the privacy considerations and make it available but anonymized. Uh, we might actually be able to solve big chunks of medicine if we had more data. Uh, longevity, we're getting older, uh, we're living longer. Uh, people have thought that you might have very old people in the next few decades. And uh, we've got the concept of biological age and chronological age. Chronological age, we can't modify, as we know. Biological age, this is the question. Can we modify it? And can we use AI to help? Um, and help not just deny illnesses, but help us live a long health span. In other words, live to a quality life for a long time instead of living a long time in misery. So there are long-lived animals, uh, they're, they're animals that last, uh, live, live a long time. Generally, if you have a bigger animal, uh, they tend to live longer. There are some exceptions to that. The naked mole rat, which I think we've seen some pictures of those, uh, they can live a long time. They seem to be resistant to cancer. Um, there might be uh, some kind of uh, elements that naked romance, uh, romance make that help us uh, to, protect against cancer. Uh, bats are also long-lived. They live a long time, yet they're very, very small. Um, they have extremely good hearing. And you know, as many of us know who are older, uh, our hearing, the high frequency components uh, are very, very, uh, become much worse from our teenage years. They start to get worse. And uh, life expectancy has got bigger for many people around the world. And uh, over the years, uh, people are getting uh, to live longer and longer and longer. And uh, a key aspect of that is technology. Uh, not necessarily lifelong technology, it's just the basics. Can we get clean water? Can we get refrigeration? Uh, can we actually get educated? Do we have electric light? And so, uh, you know, 100 years ago, many people got died uh, at a very, very young age. Uh, we now have pasteurized milk, we have garbage collection, we have sewage systems, and, uh, uh, and we have uh, studies of how we deteriorate as we get old. So you know, uh, cognitive processing, it slows down. We work differently, we think differently as we uh, become older. And, uh, and over the years, the dementia rates actually has been going down. The cohorts of people, as they each, each decade being, being born, uh, the incidence has actually uh, been going down. Now, is that related to any healthcare activity, or is it related to more education, more people going to school? Now, when we apply AI to medicine, it's very different to AI to games like Go and chess. Uh, in medicine, uh, we cannot do experiments extensively, whereas in games like video games, we can just play the video game over and over and over again. Um, and data is unlimited. Uh, in our case, data is expensive, and it could take a long time uh, to collect. 
they're self-driving cars, they're sometimes in between. We can do some simulations. And uh, in medicine, sometimes we can do simulations, uh, but often not. And in the end, we, usually have, we have to do clinical trials, which just take physical time. And in longevity, that's what it actually uh, it, it, it takes. It take, that's the fundamental um, barrier to testing things out. Uh, but we can use AI to, for many different things. Uh, we can use it for discovering drugs. We can use it for uh, just in clinical trials and those in deciding which uh, uh, doses to do next, which trial to do next, which kind of people to use. Uh, we can predict uh, mortality. Uh, we are looking for biomarkers for, for aging, and we would put these through, just like in the deep patient, to try and put these against age, aging databases. Uh, this is aging.ai from our friends in Silico Medicine. You can put your, uh, your uh, blood metrics in, and it'll predict what your biological age is, is your blood metrics that you get in your yearly physical. And the number of databases that are out there, uh, this is md.ai, it's a collection of databases. There's a longevity database for people uh, over 110. There's a dementia database from Scandinavia, the Petula database. Uh, there's GenAge, uh, which is a, a database of age-related genes. People are trying to find these genes, but collections of genes that might lend itself to uh, longevity. Uh, you can put these things through the neural network um, and try and figure out the pathways and the features, uh, either at the cell level, uh, or at the person level. Uh, so we can actually get these non-linearities to figure out what things actually would help us live longer. Uh, it's not just drugs, it can also be uh, living better at home um, uh, by looking at uh, AI-assisted technologies, uh, health monitoring, smart devices, uh, fall detection, uh, the so-called body net where we monitor everything about us and provide other information uh, to a home gateway uh, so that our doctors can monitor when we're getting ill. By not getting ill, we live longer. Uh, there's a number of companies who work in this area. Uh, there's companies that detect when you uh, might, uh, uh, when you do exercise, when you walk, and uh, uh, companies that detect when you might get is uh, get uh, foot swelling and therefore might be susceptible to a heart attack. This is from heartfelt technologies, uh, technologies that measure uh, your pers uh, perspiration, your sleep patterns, movements uh, with layers on your mattresses, and uh, predicting falls when you're like more likely to get falls, which, are, which is a big issue uh, for uh, as people get older. If you, uh, if you if you have a hip fracture, uh, it's very very uh, damaging is very very predictive of uh, reduced lifespan and you have these things that uh, hip airbags which automatically uh, explode as you uh, become uh, detect that you might fall over and we also have drugs drug discovery and drug discovery uses these knowledge graphs uh, so you might have an article that say a affects b b affects c and so these knowledge graphs will say well let's maybe a affects c as well and so we use these techniques to actually have more interpretations of what possible drugs could uh, occur. This is an example of a knowledge graph. And uh, we're using neural networks. Again, neural networks help to solve these difficult uh, problems. Um, and being able to put these things through a network, we take all the patient records, all the genomics data, all the uh, data about. Uh, from, uh, from ad hoc uh, patient anecdotes. Uh, we can either use these to repurpose drugs or develop new molecular structures to actually come up with new drugs. So I will stop there. It's been great to tell you a little bit about artificial intelligence. Uh, if you like, you can send me an email. I will send you these slides and uh, a comment, and that will be great. Thank you very much.